Good morning, everybody, and Happy New Year to everybody. And the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. We acknowledge that we are worshipping on land that has been cared for since time immemorial by our Aboriginal brothers and sisters, and in this area it was the Jagera and the Turrbal peoples. We pay our respects to their elders past and present and emerging, and we promise that we will work in covenant partnership with them. And we come into community, ready for the presence of God's Spirit to be among us. We come into this sacred space to worship. We come into a place of challenge and grace, ready to, see, to receive God's Word. And so, Holy God, open our hearts and our minds to receive your Word in a new way. Amen. So let us stand and sing, Come, now is the time to worship. Time to worship. Come, now is the time to give your heart. Come, just as you are to worship. Come, 
just as you are before your God. Come. One day every time we'll confess you are God. One day every knee will bow. Still the greatest treasure remains for those who gladly choose to die. Come, now is the time to work. And the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. You can sit down. We can do some calisthenics this morning. Let's start the new year and some fitness regime. Peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. In a socially, responsibly, distantly, you know, way. Let's covertly good way. Let's share God's peace. <laughs> For those who are young and young at heart. So we've just celebrated Christmas, haven't we? And we've celebrated the birth of, of, of Jesus, God's son. And, and in the Gospels of, of Luke and, and also in the Gospel of Matthew, we read stories about Jesus when he was born and those visitors who came to, to, to see him as well, the Magi. But John's Gospel is a little bit different. because It starts a bit differently. It doesn't have... Jesus' birth in God, John's Gospel. In fact, we meet Jesus when he, he, um, he's, fully, he's fully grown, he's an adult. And the beginning of John's Gospel starts with, with a poem that describes who Jesus is and, and why he's so important. It even says that Jesus is the Word of God. So I'm going to read a book for you all today. 
And the book is called Jesus, the Word. And let me see if I can find it here. There it is. And the book is written by Mark Francisco and Bazzuti Jones, and it is illustrated by Shelley Herrenberger. I think I pronounced that correctly. And John's Gospel actually starts. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. All things came into being through him, and without him not one thing came into being. What has come into being in him was life, and the Word became flesh and lived among us, and we have seen his glory. In the beginning, before everything, the Word lived. The Word was love. The Word was God. God's love. God's Word. In the beginning, the Word created. Heaven and earth, light and dark, sun and moon, oceans and rivers, rocks and hills, trees and flowers, animals of all kind and all people, people just like you and me. In the beginning, the word was seen and unseen. Light for all eyes, sound for all ears, scent for all noses, food for all bodies, warmth for all creation, one with all things. The word came to earth, God's word was spoken. Spoken on mountaintops, spoken in deserts, spoken on seas, all, crea all of creation whispered and echoed the word of God. The word of God said, I will set you free. I won't let you be anything but holy, good and free. The word spoke through the ages for all people just like you and me. The word came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became a child born of a woman named Mary. The word was Jesus. Jesus, the word living among us and with us, mending broken hearts, wiping tears from crying eyes, feeding the poor with bread and hope. Jesus, the word, living among us and with us, healing the blind and sick, making the lame walk, speaking God's love to all people. Jesus, the word, said, I will set you free. I won't let you be anything but holy, good and free. The word spoke through the ages for all people, just like you and me. But some people turned their backs on Jesus, the word. They did not listen. They did not believe in him. They judged him. They nailed him to a tree. Jesus, the word, died and was buried. But on the third day, Jesus, the word, rose from the dead. God's word spoke again. Do not be afraid. Peace be with you. Then Jesus, the word, went up to heaven. But the word did not leave us. Even today, the word of God forgives us, and saves us, blesses us, fills us with the Holy Spirit. God's love lives within us. The word of God says, I will set you free. I won't let you be anything but holy, good and free. The word speaks through the ages for all people, just like you and me. The end. And so Jesus, the word we celebrate at Christmas time is here with us even today. Let us pray. Thank you, Lord God, for sending your word into the world. 
Thank you that through Jesus we can learn about you. We can learn how you love us. And we can hear your word to us, spoken to us in Jesus. Thank you, God. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And let us continue in prayer with our prayers of confession. Heavenly Father, we come before you now with our confession. We have sinned against you in our thoughts and words and deeds. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbours as ourselves. And so, Lord God, we repent and we are sorry for our sins. Sins that we silently confess to you now. Lord, we ask for your forgiveness. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This is the best of all, for when we are empty, God fills us. When we are disheartened, God is compassionate. When we are wounded, God brings healing. And when we confess our sin, God forgives. It is in Christ, it is through Christ, it is because of Christ that our sins are forgiven. Thanks be to God. And I know we sang this not long ago, but we're going to sing it again. Let's stand and sing, and can it be?
And Helen, would you like to bring us our Bible reading for today? This morning's reading comes from John chapter 1 verses 1 to 9. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and without him not one thing came into being. What has come into being in him was life, and the life was the light of all people. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness did not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify to the light, so that all might believe through him. He himself was not the light, but he came to testify to the light. The true light, which enlightens everyone, was coming into the world. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thanks. Words are important, aren't they? I mean, they form a large part of how we communicate with one another. From the time that we are born, we begin learning words, and there's even a small celebration when we pass the milestone of learning to say our first word. Whether spoken or written, words help us to share ideas, to transfer knowledge, and to convey our feelings. And over the years, I would have read and heard and written and spoken and sung millions and millions of words. In fact, we probably all have. Part of my role as a minister is to use words in a way that help people to understand the words that we find in scripture. This isn't always easy as the words in the Bible were not originally written in English and so there can be different ways to interpret the words that we find there. Some words don't even have an English counterpart and so biblical scholars have had made to make best guesses as to what those ancient words mean based on the context in which they were used. And this is just one of the things that we need to consider when interpreting the words and the texts that we find in the Bible. For other contexts must also be considered. Contexts such as historical and cultural and ge geographical, social, theological, political, among others. These contexts can help us to see the larger picture and how the words we read in the Bible can teach us about God and what God is like and how we can respond to God in our own context of 21st century Brisbane. But there are some passages that seem less ambiguous, and I believe that one of them is the passage we heard read today, particularly those first five verses of our passage. With these words, we discover another word, a word that was with God and a word that was God. A word that there was at the very beginning, that was there at the very beginning with God, a word in which everything that came into being did so through him. A word that brought light and life to all people. And of course, this word is Jesus. It is an interesting concept, isn't it, to say that Jesus is the word of God. It might go against what we understand words to be. I mean, words are nouns after all, aren't they? They're objects, they're things. And maybe we thought of the word of God as being the Bible, for after all, the Bible contains words, words that are about God. And so it would make sense for us to think that the Bible is the word of God. But this passage seems to turn all of that on its head, for the author of John writes that the word of God is a person, and that person is Jesus. It might be difficult to imagine that a person can be a word, though in this context, Jesus... God's son is not just any word, but is the word. But when you think about it, it does make sense. 
For in sending God's Son into the world, God is communicating with us. God is imparting knowledge to us. God is sharing ideas and more with us. God is conveying God's feelings to us. Through Jesus, God's word, God is telling us how much God loves us and how much God wants to be in relationship with us. Awesome, huh? And so then in response to God's, God sharing God's word with us, what words do we say back to God? How do we reply to God's word? To answer this question, I would like to share with you a parable from the book The Orthodox Heretic and Other Impossible Tales, written by Peter Rollins. The parable is called Translating the Word. Excuse me a sec. It has been said that many years ago there lived a young and gifted woman named Sophia who received a vision in which God spoke to her as a dear friend. In this conversation, God asked that Sophia dedicate her life to the task of translating and distributing the word of God throughout her country. Now at this time, the printing press had only recently been invented and the only Bibles to be found were written in Latin and kept under lock and key within churches. Sophia was from a poor farming village on the outskirts of the city, so the task seemed impossible. She would have to raise a vast sum of money to purchase the necessary printing equipment, rent a building to house it, and then hire scholars with the ability to translate the Latin verse into the country's common tongue. However, the impossibility of the task did not sway her in the least. After having received her vision, Sophia sold the few items that she possessed and left the village to live on the streets of the city, begging for the money that was required and dedicating herself to any work that was available in order to help with the funds. Raising the money proved to be a long and difficult task, for while there were a few who gave generously, most only gave little, if anything, at all. In addition to this, living on the streets involved great personal suffering. But gradually, over the next 15 years, the money began to accumulate. Shortly before the plans of the printing press could be set in motion, a dreadful flood devastated a nearby town, destroying many people's homes and livelihood. When the news reached Sophia, she gathered up what she had raised and spent it on food for those who were hungry material help to rebuild lost homes and basic provisions and, to, and basic provisions for the dispossessed. Eventually, the town began to recover from the natural disaster that had befallen it, and so Sophia left and returned to the city in order to start over again, all the while remembering the vision that God had planted deep in her heart. Many more years passed slowly, extracting their heavy toll on the beautiful Sophia but there were now many who had been touched by love and dedication. And so although people were poor, the money began to accumulate once again. This time, a plague descended upon the city, stealing the lives of thousands and leaving many children without family for support. By now, Sophia was tired and very ill, yet without hesitation, she used the money that had been collected to buy medicines for the sick homes for the orphaned, and land where the dead could be buried safely. Never once did she forget the vision that God had imparted to her, but the severity of the plague required that she set this sacred call to one side in order to help with the emergency. Only when the shadow of the plague had lifted did she once again take to the streets, driven by her desire to translate the word of God and distribute it among the people. Finally, shortly before her death, Sophia was able to gather the money required for the printing press, the building and the translators. Although she was by this time close to death, Sophia lived long enough, lived long enough to see the first Bibles printed and distributed. It is said to this day that Sophia had actually accomplished her task of translating and distributing the word of God three times during her life rather than simply once the first two being more beautiful and radiant 
than the last. It is a beautiful story, isn't it? But I believe that it is more than just a lovely story. For it highlights for me that the word of God is more than just words on a page or words said out loud. God's word spoken to us, given to us, demands a response from us. God's word is not a noun, a thing that passively sits in place as something printed on the pages of a book or displayed on a screen or spoken in a conversation to be forgotten afterwards. God's word is not static, remaining in place. It cannot, for God's word is dynamic. God's word is active. And we are called to act on the word's behalf as we, inter as we internalise it, as we make it our own, as we are changed by it, and as we share it with others. To receive God's word is to act on God's word, to love God's word, to follow God's word, to live God's word, not just at Christmas time when we are reminded of the coming of God's word into our midst, but at all times, in all places, wherever we are and wherever we go. So as we celebrate the coming of Jesus into the world this Christmas, as we celebrate God's word entering into our world, not for the first time, for as we know from John's gospel, God's word has been here since the very beginning of creation, the creation of the universe, since the formation of the world itself, but coming into the world in a way that we cannot ignore as a human baby, as one of us then let us remember that it is not just a nice story to be put away after the presents have been all opened, as the decorations have come down and after all the Christmas ham has been eaten. But it is an act of God that calls us forward, that drives us on, that spurs us into action to share God's word with others, both in what we say and with what we do. And as we do this, as we share Jesus, God's word with those around us, then the stories of our communities, our suburbs, our city, our nation, and the whole world will be rewritten one word at a time. Amen. And so I thought we could sing in response, Come, long, come thou long expected Jesus. Freely we have received, let us freely give our free will offering to the Lord.
Holy God, we thank you for you sent your word into this world, into your world, to be amongst your people. Your word that came to tell us about you, to show us how much you love us. And so, Lord God, we pray that we can use these gifts that we offer today, gifts of money and resources, but the gifts of ourselves. We pray, Lord God, that, that we can take your word and use these gifts to share your word with all the world. Thank you, God. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks, everybody. Please be seated. Our notices for today, not many notices, but just a reminder that tonight the evening service isn't on. We're um, having a break, but we're returning next week. So next Sunday, the evening service or five o'clock service will return. And I thought maybe next week we could maybe, if you want to bring, bring some dinner with you. And so we can have dinner on the, on the deck outside as we uh, also celebrate Holy Communion next week. So if you're able to bring some food with you to, to share, so it's a BYO dinner, not a shared dinner. Um, yes, I think that'll be a good thing that we can do to start the year off for our evening services. Morning tea is being served this morning, of course, after the service. But just a reminder to wear your masks as you're picking up your food and, and as you then drink your tea and, and, and eat whatever yummy snacks are being prepared, um, then we can sit down and do that and we can take our masks off while we do that. That's all the notices that we have for today. Charlie, would you like to bring us our prayers for others? Let us come together and pray for others. Dear Lord, when the carols have been sung, when the presents have been opened, when the decorations and the trees have been taken down, when family and friends have gone home, when we are back to our own schedules, Lord, it is a bit difficult to bounce back from the busyness and excitement which led to the celebrations of Christmas Day. If we now feel weary and our spirits flat, it's not easy to present eagerly for worship. Yet maybe this is when our Christmas worship reaches deeper and higher than before. For today we worship in spite of sluggish feelings or in defiance of weary minds and bodies. Therefore today is very special. In the wake of Advent, Christmas and the turn of the new year, some of us are hopeful and full of expectation, for this is when the work of Christmas begins. To welcome the homeless, to feed the hungry, to heal the planet, to visit the lonely and the sick, to comfort those who are grieving, who have lost a loved one. Some of us are weary and worn. Some of us are overwhelmed and anxious, tired of COVID, tired of Delta, tired of testing, tired of border shutdowns, of having to wear masks, but as sure as the sun rises, a new year is upon us, full of possibilities, full of promise. Lord God, as we get ready to welcome the new year, we pray for both the world at large and for our family, for friends, for neighbours and our companions at work. Give us, Lord, give us eyes in our hearts so we may see the needs of others and give us the will and the courage to do something about it. We pray for those in nursing homes, those who are living alone and have no family to visit them this Christmas. And we pray for those who through the age or infirmity find themselves imprisoned within the loneliness of home watching a world outside that once had their full involvement increasingly pass them by. For those who for the first time are faced a Christmas without a precious loved one by their side. We pray for those for whom the new year will bring success and those who will experience discouragement and failure. For those in the coming year who will enjoy health and buoyant spirits and those who will suffer injury, disease, increasing handicap or mental disability. Help us to enjoy the strong and encourage those who suffer. For prominent people who govern nations, negotiate for peace, struggle against injustice and those many people in the background 
who quietly go on loving, loving their neighbour without receiving any recognition. Help us, Lord, to appreciate great gifts and to celebrate small ones. For those who during the coming year will rejoice in marriage, rejoice in the birth of a new child, and for those who must endure decline, decay, or be plunged in anguish and sorrow, for those who will go through the pains of divorce and marriage breakdowns, for churches that will seem to flourish with new members and programs, and those who appear to shrink and struggle to maintain their mission, we pray for our brothers and sisters sitting beside us in the pews. And for those of our congregation listening and watching in their homes, be with them. Lord, as we stand at the beginning of this new year, we confess our need of your presence and your guidance as we face the future. We all have our own hopes and expectations of the year ahead, but only you know what it holds for us, and only you can give us the strength and wisdom we will need to meet its challenges. Renew us, Lord. Renew our faith. Renew our compassion. Renew our energy to follow your way. Renew our passion for life for love and justice. Renew our will to grow and develop. Renew our humility to own our own shortcomings. Renew our grace in how we react to the shortcomings of others and the world as we have allowed it to become. Renew our efforts in discerning our gifts and talents and those of others. Renew our desire to listen to your call for us, for others and our community. So give us grace and give us courage to live faithfully in this imperfect world. Remind us always of the promise of your kingdom emerging around us and through us. Amen. So as we prepare to receive Holy Communion, let us stand and sing, Break Now the Bread of Life. And I'll ask the Communion Elders to come forward. Come, all who journey in faith, bring your lives fragile and holy. Here is a place where you are welcome anew. We come to see, uh, ready to see you anew. Be present, risen Lord Jesus, as you were with your disciples, and make yourself known to us in the breaking of the bread. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. Here the words of institution of this sacrament as recorded by the Apostle Paul. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, he took bread. 
And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body which is for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. In the same way also, the cup after supper, saying this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it for the remembrance of me. For as often as you eat the bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And so in according to our Saviour's command, we set this bread and this cup apart for the Holy Supper to which he calls us. And we come to you, when we come to you, God, with our prayers of thanksgiving. The Lord be with you. you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. God of grace, from age to age, you infuse every particle of the universe with wonder. From age to age, you surround every form of life with love. From age to age, you call every corner of creation with promise. For some travellers once journeyed together beneath a fiery star to seek the treasure of their hearts. Kneeling in a home, they found the gift they sought. In this new year, we also set out seeking signs of your presence. We remember how this child of Bethlehem broke bonds of oppression, challenged cultural habits, healed and comforted, taught and set the example for faith and service in your kingdom. And so we praise you with the faithful of every time and place, joining with choirs of angels and the whole creation in the eternal hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. We celebrate again that Emmanuel, God, is with us. We remember how this child born in a stable lived a life of healing and mercy and wisdom. We remember in a final meal shared with his friends before he gave himself up for us on the cross, how he gave a new meaning to bread and wine. This is my body given for you. This is the new cup of salvation. As we share this bread and cup, may we open ourselves to the strength of his love and commit ourselves to his way of peace and service as we join with others to proclaim our faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out the Holy Spirit on us and on these gifts of bread and wine that they may be for us, the body and blood of Christ. Make us one with him, one with each other, and one in ministry in the world until at last we feast with him in the kingdom. Amen. Let us continue our prayer with the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. The bread that we break is a sharing in the body of Christ. The cup that we take is a sharing in the blood of Christ. The gifts of God for the people of God. Jesus, Lamb of God. Have mercy on us. Jesus, bearer of our sins, have mercy on us. Jesus, redeemer of the world, grant us your peace. And so please remain in your seats and the servers will bring you a piece of bread and a cup. There will be a gluten option, gluten-free option available as well. And I ask that you hold the elements together and then we will share them as one.
the body of Christ broken for you. And the blood of Christ shed for you. Let us pray. We thank you, Lord, that you have fed us in this sacrament, that you have united us with Christ, and that you've given us a foretaste of the heavenly banquet prepared for all people. Amen. And so let us stand and sing once more. If I can get the right page up on my device, there we go. Let us stand and sing once more. Now let us from this table rise. So as we go out from here, give us courage, Father God, to choose again the pilgrim way, to help us to accept with joy the challenge of tomorrow's day. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and evermore. Amen. And let us say to one another the Mispa benediction. May the Lord watch between me and thee, whilst we're absent, one from the other. Amen.